Not too many people will remember this, but back in 2015, 2016, Biz News was under an enormous amount of pressure uh, because of the Guptas. They wanted to close us down. It all got exposed a year later in 2017 when something called Gupta Leaks came into the public domain. It transformed the debate on what was going on in South Africa and the ANC. And well, things have changed a lot since then. We've got something similar right now, or so it appears. Dr. Leon Schreiber is the Shadow Minister of Public Service and Administration. Uh, he's a member of, as you can see from those of you who are watching this on YouTube, uh, of the Democratic Alliance. He went to Parliament in June 2019, so he's been doing the Shadow Minister post since then, since he became an MP. Uh, he must be a nightmare for the opposition because he had a BA, did a BA, an MA, and a doctorate in political science, and prior to joining Parliament, worked at Princeton University, one of the great universities of the world, as a senior research specialist. That kind of puts you puts your background into perspective, Leon, you research things. That's, that seems to be your passion. Why did, what turned you on to researching the ANC's CADA deployment strategy, which I guess uh, from, a, from an outside um, perspective looks very much like having the kind of impact that Gupta Leaks had in this country, and that was seismic. Yes, uh, thanks very much, Alec. It's great to be back with you. And um, I actually hadn't thought about it that way, but I do think some of those research skills are coming in useful. Um, and, and actually, there is some overlap if you want to be an effective member of parliament, that you you must have the ability to do deep dives, analyze, and, and find patterns. So, um, I mean, my interest in this issue really predates even entering politics. As you say, I spent a few years working at Princeton University where I had the enormous privilege of um, looking at developing countries that had succeeded in building capable state institutions. And I got to visit these places, really dozens of countries in Africa, uh, in Asia, and, and really learning from what it takes to actually build a functioning state institution, which is a very rare thing in South Africa now outside probably of where the DA governs. So uh, what I saw there, if you look at, uh, you know, very interesting examples like securing property rights in Rwanda, getting proper tax collection going in a place like Vietnam. Um, you know, you, you, you really learn that political interference and subverting appointment processes to the whims of p politicians and of political parties is the first thing that collapses the, the capacity of the state. So I was really driven about this issue when I entered parliament in 2019. And I remember having a meeting with the then chief whip, John Stiernes, and of course, who's now the leader of the party, where I basically said, look, I, I would like this portfolio if there's no one else who wants it or, or anyone else who's better qualified, because I think I can make a real impact on this issue of, of state capacity and of cater deployment, because it really sat at the heart. It was clear to me back then already. It had to sit at the heart of state capture, because the question that we have to ask about state capture is how these people were appointed. How did a Dudu Mieni or a Slaudi Mutsuning or a Brian Mulefe get their hands on power at the most important institutions in South Africa? And the answer to that question is the deployment committee, as we now see uh, with 1,300 pages of documents that we've managed to um, obtain and now make public, that that is the committee that ensures that we have incompetence or corrupt people who are placed there on the basis of their loyalty to the ANC rather than on their ability to do the job. So that's really how I came into this. Um, and that has really been my focus for the past five years, relentlessly pursuing this issue of cater deployment, the president's role in it as the former chairman during the Zuma years, and then using every lever at my disposal, including an end cater deployment bill that we tabled in parliament, which was unanimously supported by the opposition, which was quite a significant moment, I think. And the only reason we still have cater deployment is because the ANC voted against that bill. Um, and then, of course, the court challenges, the parliamentary questions, and all the other tools that we have used over the last five years. How long has it taken? Well, I mean, the court process to get these records public took over three years. Um, the ANC initially refused my request that, in terms of the Promotion of Access to Information Act, um, that it should actually make public its uh, minutes, 
its CVs uh, that it considered, WhatsApp conversations, email conversations, um, everything relating to the deployment committee. And our argument back then is the same as now, that the deployment committee is not a private uh, dinner party where people discuss who they like and who they don't like. It is a meeting uh, that takes decisions and then uh, gives direction to people in the state making those appointments. And that is really the critical link because, Alec, you and I can sit around and talk for hours about who we like and don't like. And that's fine. We can all do that. But the difference comes if you or I then go and tell a minister that this is the person we want appointed. And if you don't comply, then you're going to be disciplined. That is where cater deployment crosses over into the public interest. And that is why, despite the ANC going to the High Court, the Supreme Court of Appeal, and the Constitutional Court, we ultimately did obtain those records because the courts agreed with us that this is not just a private dinner party. This is something that has a profound impact on South Africans. And we all know this. Just try to switch on the lights when there's load shedding. Just try to open the tap when there's no water. Those are the consequences of catered employment that the people live with every day. So if you can give us a parallel here, and I, I'm going to throw something at you and perhaps you could, you could just elaborate. If you had catered employment in the appointment of surgeons as long as a guy who's maybe passed standard one at school is loyal to the party, he can be given a scalpel to do brain surgery in effect because you're getting people who are totally unqualified for the positions that they've been given in, um, in an organization that's one third of the economy, i.e. the state, but the only qualification they require is that they are loyal to the party have some kind of friends in highly influential political positions. Am I reading this correctly? I think it's a fair comparison. Um, and I, I mean, I made the point a few months ago that we would never have accepted it if the ANC Cater Deployment Committee selected the Springbok team on the basis of their loyalty to the party. Um, and I submit to you, we would have crashed out of the World Cup before we even started if that was the case. So why do we accept it when it comes to ESCOP? Why do we accept it when it comes to South African Airways, to Transnet? I mean, Transnet, as we speak, Alec, the, the CEO's appointment that was selected by the board is being blocked because the deployment committee is not happy with a particular person. That's as we speak. It's not, you know, something that happened in the past. So why do we accept it when it comes to institutions upon which all of our lives and livelihoods ultimately depend? And I think that that is the question that we are now really putting to the people of South Africa as well by exposing these records. But I do want to get into some of it um, just uh, to demonstrate the breathtaking scale of, of what you say and, and, the, and the, the comparison that you make. So it probably is even worse than what you say because we have found in these records a database containing hundreds of names. Um, and the, the title of this database is uh, Cadres for, for Consideration, or Names for Consideration of, of ANC Cadres. Now, if you go and look at this database, first of all, you will be struck by some of the examples of you know, people who, whose only job ever has been in politics and who have never you know, demonstrated the skills necessary to re lead a state-owned enterprise or a government department. That's the first thing. But the second thing is that in this database, what you actually have is the ANC actively looking for jobs for its cadres. So in other words, it's not even a case of there's a vacancy and then you know, someone applies. In some of these cases, they are actively looking to find employment for people, to, to place them in positions of power based on a predetermined list. That is quite a, a, an astounding revelation. And then you also have the fact that there is, we now know, an ANC cater deployment WhatsApp group. Now, what we can see in some of these messages is that, you know, ANC officials will sit uh, on, this, on this group and discuss a particular vacancy or a board that has to fill some vacancies, and they will simply send a WhatsApp saying, these are the names we want. I mean, just imagine the brazenness of essentially capturing a state through WhatsApp. That is what we are seeing in, in, in some of these records now. So I think your comparison is, uh, in, is, is informative. It helps us think through what's actually going on here, but it goes deeper than that because you would actually have to have the unqualified person on some secret database. And you would even have to say to, to the person making the appointment uh, that I'm going to send you a WhatsApp 
uh, and then this is this is the decision. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility that the girlfriend or lover of someone who's politically powerful would be given a very senior position. This is what Paula Sullivan alleges uh, happened with Dudu Mjeni, that she was had a romantic interest with the then president, Jacob Zuma. That, that suddenly now in the past seemed in the realms of science fiction, now it seems to be science fact. But one step further on this, if this is the way that jobs are organized or the power of the state or the levers of the state are organized, does it not also support many allegations that we've gotten here but never been able to prove that the ANC has told companies who they need to be putting in their black economic empowerment consortia, i.e. give away shareholders, slice of the company that's owned by shareholders to these guys because we as the state say you must do it. I just briefly want to say your example about Dudu Mieni. This is exactly why cater deployment is the fundamental root cause of, of, of state capture because it is the channel that creates the ability for people to, you know, make nepotistic appointments, uh, et cetera. So in other words, if there was no channel like this, no parallel process that you could insert someone into a, an appointment process, then you would be forced to actually run with the selection panel and and try to find the person who comes out tops there. And, and that's really what this fight is about, is getting it to actually be a transparent, merit-based process that is insulated against political interference. But, yeah, I mean... I, so I think the the bigger point here about uh, what we're busy, you know, challenging here is is precisely to move away from examples where we have all kinds of nefarious considerations except the ones that actually matter. And I think that that, that that's the fundamental point that we need to get across through this fight. Um, and so whether it takes courts to weigh into that, whether it takes you know, the election coming up and hopefully getting people to understand what's going on and, and where the root causes of failure comes from, we will be pursuing all of those um, channels, Alec, to, to continue to drive this particular issue. Um, but, you know, we talked about the Gupta leaks um, and, and I think your point was very well made about how it actually, I think you said it, it changed the political conversation. Um, and I think that that's kind of the moment we're in now. Even the discussion we're having today, the ability to not talk in abstracts of what, what could be happening, but to actually be able to go and reference things that really did happen and, as I say, are continuing to happen, I think is potentially a real game changer for us to not have to have, you know, only speculation. We can all put together the puzzle pieces. I think this is where the BE question does feature. Because um, I've, I, I remember writing an op-ed about the link between cater deployment and BEE a few years ago. Um, and essentially, the argument is that these, these are two sides of the same coin. Because they are both geared towards giving the ANC control over the levers of power. And what is very interesting that many people may not know is that the ANC's actual cater deployment policy, the document itself, is not limited only to the state. It mentions the private sector and the need for cadres to actually also be deployed into the private sector. And it is very easy to see how a system that is clearly, I mean, very refined and extensive. I mean, if you have 1,300 pages of records, um, only covering, by the way, a short period of, of, the, of the, the time that we were actually looking for. And we will be announcing additional steps on that soon because the ANC has actually not complied with the court's order. But even if you look at those limited, that limited period, this is very, a very extensive system. And why would it not also then be used to influence other aspects of society? This is ultimately going back to the ANC's ideological um, rooting in the National Democratic Revolution, in the idea that the party must capture and control all levers of power in society. That's exactly what the Cater Deployment Policy says. So... As we speak, the ANC has only given us um, records that, or as far as we can tell, relate to the state. But that does not mean that there are not additional things out there where there could be interference and influence in the private sector. And again, if you look at, this is where President Ramaphosa becomes such a fascinating case study um, in actually state capture. Because he himself 
is a beneficiary of BE, of crony capitalism, of being a connected ANC cadre in the private sector. And then he went on from 2013 to actually chair the deployment committee that did the same thing to the state. And I think that this is a very important part of what we're discussing is that once and for all, any suggestion that Cyril Ramaphosa was not part of the state capture project is dead once you see how the Cato Deployment Committee operates and understand that he was the chairman of this thing throughout the Zuma years. But the mind boggles. Maria Ramos goes from a deployed Cato position to CEO of EPSA. Uh, Jill Marcus goes from a communication specialist to chairman of EPSA. Trevor Manuel goes from the finance minister to chairman of Old Mutual, and so on, and so on, and so on. How deep this runs, I guess, will only become evident over time. But, Leon, you care, I care. Does South Africa care? I think South Africa does care. I can say to you that um, the, the way in which this issue has gained prominence over the past few years, and obviously I think the DA's work has been central to that, but so has the State Capture Commission. We should not forget that Judge Zonda identified Cater deployment as laying the foundation for state capture, and that it is, he found it to be unconstitutional for anyone to consider the views of political party committees when making appointments. So I think that this, if you, if you go back to 2019, interestingly, I think if you ask people, have you heard of Cater deployment, many people would have said no. I think that the picture, picture has changed by today. And what I certainly pick up from, from interactions on the ground is that there's an almost visceral response to this idea that the ANC can reserve positions of power for its cronies and for itself. And I think there's an element that we underestimate um, if we only talk sort of at the, you know, the more systemic levels of, of what cater deployment does. Because this same thing happens all the way down to your local government sphere. And what I have gotten quite a few messages uh, over the last few weeks from people who experience cater deployment in a way that relates to things like EPWP work opportunities, where there may be part-time jobs available in a rural municipality where, where there's desperate poverty and unemployment. And then those opportunities are dished out by ANC ward councillors to their fellow ANC comrades. And we should not underestimate the resentment that this breeds um, in communities that are far removed from, you know, necessarily what's going on in, in Parliament or the courts, but who actually viscerally experience the unfairness, the discrimination, and of course also the corruption that comes from cater deployment. So perhaps in a sense, what the DA is has achieved and will continue to do is to actually work with the public to inform them and, and actually give people the language to understand what's going on, what is happening to them. Because once you explain to someone what cater deployment is, who may never have heard the term, I think all South Africans get it. Because we've all seen what happens when people are favored because they are close to the ANC. We've, we've seen what it does to service delivery. We've seen how it discriminates and excludes people who may deserve positions more than an ANC cater. So I would not actually underestimate the impact that this issue is having on the ground, and perhaps the best um, example of the fact that this really is something that's resonating is the response of the ANC. And we have seen them over the last few weeks really in a state of panic about this issue and trying to come up with all kinds of excuses on the one hand, but on the other hand saying that they will continue with this no matter what happens. So the fact that we have the ANC now in a space where they've been forced to expose these documents where they're forced to actually talk about the fact that they are the cause of cater deployment, I think shows very clearly that this is an issue that has hurt the ANC and that people on the ground, including their own voters, are asking difficult questions about why they are reserving positions for their cronies and, and causing the kind of state failure that we see around us. There's a heck of a lot more that we could go into the point that Pravin Gordon was in trouble with the KDEP deployment committee, no doubt, over the uh, appointment of Andre de Reiter. Well, uh, we know what happened there and many other issues. But perhaps a final one, a final very difficult question for you before you go is, let's say that there is a 
new government, which does not include the ANC after the election on the 29th of May. With all these cadres deployed throughout the public sector, and it's gone on for 30 years, how does one start reversing those kind of uh, deficiencies that we have in a system which is clearly broken? Well, I would start by saying that we have to make sure that that new government is anchored by a party that understands these dynamics. There will be no point in, in, in parties assuming government if you don't understand what you're in for. And I would say the DA, more than any other party in South Africa, understands these dynamics because we have inherited ANC governments um, on multiple occasions and, and across the country. Um, you know, you can go back to Cape Town in 2006. People look at it now and see the, the, the track record of delivery. But Cape Town was going down the same road as, as other cities in South Africa back then. And when Helen Zilla became the mayor, she had to actually clear out, um, you know, people who were not able to do the job and institute new appointment processes that would look for skilled people rather than cadres from any political party. And, you know, that is the pattern that you see in Cape Town. It's the same thing you see in the Western Cape. And I would say it's the same thing we're experiencing in Tswane right now. People are obviously, you know, still dealing with the consequences of, of Tswane that had gone much further down the line than Cape Town in 2006 in terms of what cadre deployment has done to service delivery. So our mayor there is not only on the front line of this battle of how you actually get a civil service working again after three decades of cadre deployment, but it is very important in the party that we're able to learn from people like him and others in government so that we know what to expect uh, when we have a new government that actually needs to deal with this at a national level. So I think, you know, it's going to be fundamentally important that people support the DA on the 29th of May with exactly this prospect in mind that we need a party that is clear about the role of cadre deployment in collapsing the state and is determined to confront it. And I would end by saying this is why, you know, at our manifesto launch uh, uh, this past weekend, uh, abolishing cadre deployment and instituting a new merit-based appointment process that is completely fear of, free of political interference from any party is one of the apex priorities in our manifesto. And I think it reflects the seriousness not only of the situation, but also of the DA. I mean, we are putting this right front and center because we are serious about taking power and we know exactly the question you have asked is what we will have to confront. We will have to fundamentally reform the Public Service Act. We will have to fundamentally reform the Public Service Commission and we will have to fundamentally reform how we make appointments in the public sector in South Africa so that we can start finding capable people who are there because they can do the job not, not because they are serving a particular political party. Thank heavens we have a template. That South Africa, you can look to the Western Cape uh, and data after data is telling us that it can be done. And I think that surely is a message of hope. Dr. Leon Schreiber is the Shadow Minister of Public Service and Administration with the Democratic Alliance. And I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. 